Hi and welcome back to another video. If I would ask you what you think this is, I'm pretty sure that 99% would reply that this is a memory module. It kind of is memory, but it's not a normal DRAM module. This is actually an SSD. And back then in 2010, when this came to the market, SSDs were still in the 2.5 inch format and you typically had to connect it over the SATA cable and also SATA power and you would have it apart from your mainboard inside your case. And this vendor figured out in 2010, probably also earlier because it takes time for development, but they probably figured out that having something that can be plugged directly onto the mainboard would be much more convenient. M.2 NVMe SSDs came much later, so like three or four years later than this. So that was actually a quite nice idea, but looks like it didn't really make it. We're still going to check it out today. The product which we're going to check out today is called SATADIM, and the name pretty much explains what we also have in front of us. Quick note about this logo because that's the manufacturer. It was called Viking Modular. Nowadays, if you want to access the page Viking Modular, it doesn't exist anymore. There is something that sounds kind of similar. It's called Viking Technology, which you can still access, but there is no information about something that's called SATADIM. And what we have here, again, it looks like a memory stick, a normal DRAM stick, but that's not the case. It's still called DIM, so Dual Inline Memory Module, which is true because it's still a memory module, but it doesn't contain RAM, it contains flash storage. We can see all these flash modules right here, and in the center we have a pretty typical Sandforce controller from back in the day that was pretty common on like OCC drives, for example, and that was also used on this SATA DIM. If we turn it around, that's why you know it's called SATA DIM, because it's a DIM with a SATA connector that's forming the entire SSD. It is using DDR3 standard, which can be a bit difficult because if we want to plug it in an day system, I mean, we are at DDR5 and I mean, DDR4 is still quite recent, but yeah, DDR3, that's not going to work out on more recent platforms. We will get back to that problem later, but just inspecting how this thing is built, we have all the flash on the back with the controller in the center, and then there is a lot more storage like flash chips next to it and in the center we have the power supply and also the SATA connector. The thing is there is not really much information about this available. You can still find some news and reviews from back in the day but not a lot of information. The center we are quite sure is responsible or is at least related to the power supply. Back then with DDR3 the supply voltage was 1.5 volt but that's just for the memory chips themselves. There is also the SPD voltage which was for the SPD chip. The SPD chip typically contains the information about the memory stick and this voltage is 3.3 volt. And that's probably what would be required for like a lot of controllers and stuff. Still, I'm not sure if maybe also five volt would have been required on some of these parts. And that's, I mean, we have four inductors on here, which somehow reminds me of a step up controller that could be for five volt, but I'm not entirely sure. But we know that this is part of the voltage supply. Going back to the sticker in the front, we can see a ton of like letters and numbers and in the center we see 1100. I'm not quite sure what the first one stands for, but the 100 after it stands for the capacity. So this is a stick with 100 gigabyte of capacity. When it comes to the flash itself, back then there was MLC and SLC available. Again, I'm not sure because there is no data sheet or anything about this. I'm not sure if this one is using MLC or SLC. There were multiple different versions of this out there and if we go back to the sticker it reads 3400. Again, I'm not sure what the 3 stands for, could be the generation, but 400 means that this is a 400 gigabyte module. And if we turn it around that you can also see that it looks a bit different. Generally speaking, again we have some voltage supply related PCB again in the center. Here would actually be space for a SATA connector. But following this cable that's more like a thin PCB and then a PCB in the end, you can see that this is actually our SATA connection. And I think this might be an optimized version for very slim systems. Because if you think about having a slim server or like a mini ITX system, then plugging a SATA connector from top might not be as convenient. So maybe this was the way to solve this issue. If we compare the previous stick, the first one, 
to the second one, it's not only the SATA connector which is different, but also in addition we have a capacitor on the left. And honestly speaking, I first had to figure out what this even is. I mean, it looked like a battery first, but then if you look at the specs and everything and you try to Google it, then you figure out this is actually a cap. And it also reads 5.5 volt. And then I thought, I mean, that's why I would assume that this might be a step up converter because why would you use 5.5, which is pretty close to five instead of like a 3.3 one. Mm. We will try to measure this once we are going to use it. I didn't use them so far, so I have literally no idea. We will try to do that uh, together. And like comparing both, you can see that also in the previous one, you could see that they are our solar pads. So you could theoretically also probably place the same cap on there. I'm not sure why it exists on this one and not on this one. The third stick I found, I think is a little bit more recent. It's probably still not new, but I mean, if you just compare how it looks like and also that it has a lot less flash chips, flash storage, but it's still 100 gigabyte in total capacity, but it only features four flash chips. That's why I think it has higher capacity, could be a more recent design. The PCB which we have on here is a stacked PCB which is just plugged on there with connectors which you can also see if you look from the side. So we will try to gently remove this. As you can see connected over those three connectors. And as I said before I assume that this is just purely for voltage regulation. That is also why I assumed that this should be a newer version because it kind of fully integrates the power supply to the module and also has like a different uh, SATA cable. If you check out the back, there is pretty much nothing except for a few caps and also a second tiny PCB that is forming the connection from the SATA cable to the PCB again over a clippable connector. Looking back to 2010, that was actually a brilliant design because back then everything had to be wired, you had to use an external SSD and I think the vendor Viking Modular, they figured out that there is a need to plug SSDs directly into your system without like wasting full PCIe connectors, so prior to M.2 NVMe SSDs. But then again, I mean, it's using DDR3, so you are kind of limited to this standard. And once you want to maybe transition to a newer board, it might not work out once DDR4 was out. But apart from that, it's, it's pretty nice. We will use this C97 board to at least power the DIMM, but I want to plug it to a newer system because I have pretty much everything installed. And then we will try to do some performance analysis. And also what you have to keep in mind, it's not only using DDR3, so you're kind of limited to the standard, but it's also utilizing a slot. So depending on how many modules you want to use, you might just lose DIMM capacity, like memory capacity. If you would run full four memory sticks on here, how would you plug the SATA DIMM? That's also one thing to consider. And especially in servers, if you would like occupy all the memory DIMMs, then there might not be space for the SATA DIMM. So that's also something that was maybe not so nice. And this is how it could have looked like. You just have your primary two DIMMs and then in front or maybe also in the sandwich configuration, you would use the SATA DIMM. Plug in your SATA cable and move it all the way back into your mainboard. And as I said before, I plugged this into my donor system and plugged it into the primary one. And now I want to figure out, can we first of all detect it? And if yes, can we also run some benchmarks? That looks pretty promising, opened up the storage management and I was greeted with this message. I know it's German, but it basically tells me that I have to initialize the drive with either MBR or GPT, but that looks correct with the 400 gigabyte of size. Okay, that doesn't look too good. Basically it tells me that there is an input output error on the device and it cannot proceed. Not sure what's actually going on. Try it again with MBR, but the error remains. I will just try a different stick. I switched to the newer version, which also has the different cable. Maybe this is easier to work with. It doesn't have 400 gigabyte of capacity, but honestly, that doesn't matter. Interestingly, with this stick, as you can see that the LED is flashing, the system is instantly shutting down. So it tries to start and then instantly shuts down again, which didn't happen with the other stick. So yeah, I will switch again. I switched to the third version, also removed one of the other memory sticks because honestly I don't need them. At least now it's not cycling again, maybe this will work. I will switch back to the main system. I think this looks better, at least there is no error displayed in the front. I will try to initialize it now. Mm, 
Nice. Formatting the drive took over five minutes, which is a long time, but at least it worked. With Crystal Disk Info, we can see that it's definitely a used drive, has been powered on 1500 times and it was used for 6500 hours. That is 273 days. Yeah, so that's definitely not a brand new drive. It still tells me that it's 100% fine, but let's perform a benchmark. 223 megabytes per second in sequential read. I mean, that's not like light speed, but that is still pretty quick for 2010. I mean, that would have been worked very well in 2010. The write speed though, with almost 90 megabyte per second, yeah, that's not really quick. I decided to test the remaining sticks and now you can see that the second 400 gigabyte stick is plugged. And again, in the other system, I cannot detect it at all. So even in Drive Manager, I cannot see the stick at all. Unfortunately, I could not find any kind of pricing that Viking Modular asked for back in the day. And I think one reason why it never became popular was because it was also never an like consumer product. It was just an enterprise product and maybe it just didn't work out there for multiple reasons. Maybe pricing because I have no idea how much it costs versus a normal SSD. The components themselves are pretty much comparable to any other SSD from like 2009 to 2010. Like an OCC drive, it's the same. Sandforce SF1500 controller that was popular back then. But apart from that, I mean, pricing could be one aspect and then that you lose DIMMs or DIMM slots, which is probably a negative aspect. But apart from that, I think it's brilliant at the time that they figured out that there would be a need for SSDs without a lot of cables and easy to install. I think it's, it's pretty nice, but well, M.2 drives are a lot easier and you don't lose memory capacity. So much about another product that is kind of obscure, never made it to the market. I hope it was interesting for you. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.